coming up towards 6.15 in Trinidad and Tobago as we show you the traffic lining up awaiting the green light uh, in Deby, uh, looking to get out onto the link road and that roundabout before they get on uh, to the highway proper and the camera of TrafficTT.com switching around to show you that traffic coming out of uh, the Deby area as uh, we move along here uh, this morning. But uh, if you are uh, on uh, the Churchill Roosevelt Highway uh, before St. Augustine coming westwards and you're wondering about why traffic is backing up, it's because of this situation captured uh, by our reporter Nika Parsonal. There's an accident on uh, the highway in the area of St. Augustine and uh, therefore there's just one lane uh, that's active. Uh, police are at the scene, uh, emergency response at the scene as well. So uh, we urge you just to exercise patience and they'll try to sort that out as quickly as they can. Uh, so just one lane in use at the moment. So if you sense that the traffic is backing up more than you would usually expect east of St. Augustine and you're heading westwards, this is what is happening. And we want to thank uh, our reporter Nika Pasanlal uh, for giving us that situation. So just please be mindful of that as you're coming in from the east uh, this morning. Well, uh, let's uh, put our focus this morning in our family focus series, our penultimate edition. Uh, before we wrap it up uh, for this season uh, next Wednesday and then we'll resume in December. Let's talk about mental health awareness. It's still something relatively new in Trinidad and Tobago as far as the sense of awareness, not mental health, because that is uh, the, the issue, mental health issues are, have been a, a challenge for a long, long time. But whether or not we give it the attention that it requires is another story. This month, September, is Suicide Prevention Month. And while suicide or suicidal thoughts uh, are not classified as a mental illness, it can be a contributing factor. What is the difference? Uh, that is the starting point of today's focus on the family discussion and how uh, we can better assist our loved ones. Uh, as I said, we are in season three. There's one more episode to go before uh, we break and resume again in the last month of the year in December. And we've got a frequent uh, guest with us uh, this morning, Hanif Benjamin, a clinical therapist and clinical traumatologist. He is the president and chief executive officer of the Center for Human Development Group of Companies Limited. And he's here to talk about uh, the issues associated with suicide. Good to see you once again. Always Thank a pleasure very for much, you, always. Uh, for joining us. Um, it, it's sometimes an uncomfortable topic uh, to, to, to deal with the issues of suicide and suicide awareness and uh, indeed sometimes you have to tread very carefully before you're accused of giving people uh, ideas in a particular direction whether to, to, to move towards the suicidal direction if they are suffering from depression and so on. How do we begin a discussion like this? Fazir, I think um, you, you quite aptly opened, it is a very difficult topic and one that we seldom have. And for too long, suicidality, non-suicidal self-harm has been on, on, on the back burner. However, it's been a, a major problem, not only in Trinidad and Tobago, but the world at large. And for every one suicide, for you, we're talking about the individual, the family, the school, the community, the work, the church. Um, those are the people affected. And we seldom speak about the situation. But more and more, when you look at the data throughout the world, it tells a very painful picture. Um, and, and if I were to give you some context, there are close to 800 people who die from suicide every year. And that is a suicide every 40 seconds. You know? And what they're saying is for every one um, successful, not in a good way, suicide, there are 20 attempts at suicidality. That, that's a global, global number. Global, yes. Global number and I will break about. it down into Trinidad in a short while. Sure. And uh, for every suicide... You said 800,000. 800,000, 800, yes. yes 800,000 yeah. person die from suicidality every year. Um, 79% of global suicide occur in, low, occur in low and middle income countries. And suicide is the second leading cause among adolescent and, and, and early ad, um, adulthood. That speaks. It is saying to us that our children are dying more from suicide than probably any other things out here. Now, when we talk about Trinidad, we're talking about an average of about 7.3% or 100,000 of the global average. That is Trinidad and Tobago. We are talking about 193 suicide reporting in 2012. And of that, 146 were males. Very staggering are the statistics in terms of male in relation to female. Male commit suicide successfully more than females. However, females attempt suicide more than males. 
right? When a male decides that they want to kill oneself, there is no if, ands, or but about it. They just go about and they just do it. Between 2005 and 2012, there are 727 people officially died of suicidality in this country. And they're saying that Trinidad and Tobago is the highest in this region in relation to suicide. And for every single suicide I just mentioned, there are 20 others who have tried it. And in a study in 2011, men have shockingly way higher rates. And so for zero, when you put all of that into context, we're talking about a, 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 a crisis of suicide and one that we don't talk about. We wait for September and of course we, we talk about it and we have a, a march here or we, we have a program there. But this issue of suicidality is one that has been cemented in our society for a long, long time. And, and, and therefore, uh, I mean, in, in, in getting into the meat of our discussion uh, this morning, what accounts for that? Why is it that, that uh, Trinidad and Tobago, and I understand Guyana's numbers are pretty high yes. uh, as well, uh, why is it? What, what uh, have the studies reveal any specific factors as mm -hmm. to why Trinidad and Tobago should have such worryingly high numbers? Well, I'm not sure if there is a specific in terms of Trinidad and Tobago, but overall, when you look at the, 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 the studies, they are all saying the same thing. Now, the difference in Guyana is that you have a lot of murder-suicide. That is, is, is skyrocketing right now and has been for some time. Um, but overall, when you look at suicidality, there are commonalities, and the commonalities are really people who have difficulties coping with situations. People who are living in despair, people who feel as if there are no hope, people who feel as if their lives are worthless, people who feel as if they have nothing to gain, nothing to accomplish, and those are the commonality across the board. People who have limited coping mechanisms to deal with their difficulties. Now, on the other hand, there are also people who are on the narcissistic spectrum who cannot deal with, with, with issues of, of, of shame, and stuff so if you are ashamed public life figures they take their lives and stuff but when you look at overall you're talking about people who are dealing with some form of trauma some people who have been dealing with some form of whether it is rape or, or loss and they're not able to deal with those things and you're also talking about a continuum from non-suicidal self-injury to suicide and that is where people are dealing with internal conflict and internal pain and because they are not able to manage such conflict and pain, they inflict wounds and injuries to themselves uh, to harm their body. And, and I will delineate because there's yeah. a difference as well. Huh? And that also leads to suicidality. And those are the commonalities throughout the world in terms of why people are killing oneself. Uh, and therefore, because we, we, we're trying to identify, we're trying to establish what it is, what it is that we're talking about, uh, what, what is the next step? What, what do we do as a society that could actually take us beyond the usual September month dialogue and, and, and uh, attempt to raise awareness? What should we be doing as a society? Well, at, uh, well you're jumping to the end here. But, okay, but, all right. No, no, no. But, mm. but it's at a critical and important point because all of the studies... Number one, as with mental health, is it is a taboo subject. People don't want to talk about it. And when you open you, you made a very powerful point. People think that if you speak about suicidality, you're going to push people to commit. Give people ideas in yeah, their Yeah, and I think it's foolish, right? Because why would someone have a conversation and, 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 and that will then turn into causing someone? The information is readily available. As a matter of fact, the studies are saying to us that people who want to commit suicide for zero, they're Google. They Google exactly how to, what are the most successful ways of committing suicide. Some people look for the most, the less painful ways. It is there. And so not having the conversation, not embarking upon education, to me is again working from behind the eight ball. And so one of the reasons, all of the research are saying to us that we need to have this, begin, this conversation start from our primary school. Because the research is also saying to us that non-suicidal self-harm start from about the ages of 10 to 12. 
And that is how early our children are starting to, to, to experience depression and, and, and anxiety and cutting and stuff. And suicide are also starting as early as age 10. And so, for zero, we need to begin a conversation, or beyond a conversation, as a matter of fact. We, begin, we, we must begin to help people to understand what are the, 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 the things you feel, why you behave in a particular way, why you go down a particular road. And we must begin to help people to cope with their challenges as early as primary school. So let's talk about those coping mechanisms and when we get, get around to it, what, as to the, the, rather than bringing the end back up to the top <laughs> in, in talking about uh, what, what we should be doing in raising awareness, let's talk about those coping me mechanisms. Let's talk about whether, whether it should be a case of what signs should we be looking for? Mm -hmm. What do we do? How do we assist? What, what are we talking about? Well, for you, it is important to understand that people who are living now, there's a serious correlation between depression and suicidality. There's a serious correlation. A person who commits suicide, unless it is sudden, been dealing with depression for some time. And you know, normally when somebody kills itself, people say, well, you know, we really noticed and we really, but we don't pay attention. So these are the things that we need to pay attention to. People who become isolated. You were the party of the, the crowd, everybody know you, and, but then you start pulling away from things that you love. Right in Handinia, we call that sadness. So all of a sudden, everything is, is, is crowded with sadness and doom and gloom. People start speaking in a particular way. For example, the end of the world. Everything that they speak about, it speaks with finality. Right? People start giving away their stuff. They're no longer interested in the things that they once had. So they start giving away their, their, their stuff that they would not ordinarily give away. So those are some of the early signs as well. Again, you also need to pay attention to self-injurious behavior because there it starts as well because they're trying to deal with some form of emotional, internal stressors that unless they're able to cope with that, it leads to suicidality and so we need to pay attention to that sometimes people say straight up i want to kill myself but we take it for a joke again because we don't take suicide seriously and i tell people don't ever make that joke with me you ever make a joke about suicidality you go into mount hope you understand i i i don't play because i don't know and i don't want to take a chance as to whether or not you are joking or not and the fact that you have even thought about it means that there is something that needs to be dealt with now the other major component here is when we see these signs and symptoms we seldom act on it and we don't act on it again because of shame and guilt what, shame and what, guilt. When you say sh why shame and guilt, as far as acting on it, because there are two things for zero that we need to consider. People believe of well, one suicidality is still against the law on the books, right? And two, religion. There's a religious, a strong religious taboo. Very, 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 very strong religious taboo. And when you look at those things, people pull away because either one, they are shame of God or, or shame before going before God and, and whatever their God might be. Also, you're talking about being shunned. For example, if there was an attempted suicide and you survived, um, well, of course, attempted suicide, you feel as if now you are being persecuted because of the attempt. So people don't talk about it. And that is a major part of what I want to talk about today. Because you see, Fazir, we always talk about the attempt or the suicidality. We don't talk about after. After suicide, after the attempt, those are the critical and important conversations that we don't have. Before we get to that, and, and, and I know you have a step-by-step -step process mm -hmm. that you want to take us through this morning, you mentioned the, the, what you might, might want to describe as the obvious signs. What about someone who's an introvert? What about someone who's really just very quiet and you can't really tell whether that person is really something wrong here or just that it's normally they're, they're, they're mannered but they just seem very, very quiet and they might be going through some inner turmoil. Is that more difficult to detect? I, 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 as a clinician, I say no because I always believe whether you are operating on very extroverted behavior, you're loud and you're out there, or you are operating on extreme introversion, there is always a baseline. There is always what that is. And there is always below or above those baselines. So regardless of where you operate on the continuum of, 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 of um, extroversion or introversion, there is a place that you are settled. 
And once you are below that settled place, someone should notice. You see, because you always hear people say, but I didn't, I, sadly, even in the same family circle, they say, well, I, I got no signs. I didn't know that this is what he or she was going through. I didn't realize this at all. And maybe I should have been more aware of what is going on. But when you really examine it, Fazir, you notice the signs. There are always signs. Unless, of course, I, I say that something happened and immediately upon that, someone took their life. Outside of that, if a person is living with, with, with challenges that is leading to suicidality, you would know. And so, again, it is really about how well you know the people in your circle. And I think that is a major challenge. We are very surface level people. That's why I say to people, if you come and ask me how you're doing, I want to tell you how I'm doing. But generally, you ask me how I'm doing because it's just a man of respect. How you, you, don't, doing? you don't really want to you know. You really don't want to know. And I, so I, I stop asking people, I say, how are things? Because if I ask you how you are doing, I genuinely want to know how you are doing. But we are operating on the surface for zero. And because of that, we don't listen to the sometimes the, the signs that are not spoken, especially in children and adolescents. It is very clear, you know. You see it. You see your child withdrawing. For adults, you see it. You see a drop in their work performance. You see a drop in the way they dress. You see a drop in, 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 in their, their, their love for what they used to do. You see those things. The, 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 the Friday evening hangout is no longer there. They no longer want to entertain friends. They no longer want to come to work. And if they do, their work quality drops. Every facet of the lifespan, you see it, even in the older adults. We see it when you're talking about, um, um, even though you're getting older and probably more lonely or whatever the case is, you can also see when an older adult steps into, into um, depression. And that is another topic that we need to talk about on a different occasion. Sure. How, how does the older people deal with depression? And it mirrors very closely to what they live every day. But we don't pay attention to it as well because we just think that they're they old and, and that's the how it is. To go in yeah, here. you understand? And so you, when you're really talking about how, what it looks like, it is very there in our faces, you know. But we don't pay attention to the sign. And I tell people all the time, again, whether you are loud and aggressive or whether you are not, you can tell that your normal, whatever that normal is to you, has changed over time. We're going to take a break in a short while and, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take the step-by-step the -step process uh, in our discussion with Hanif Benjamin in relation to the issues associated with suicide, September being Suicide Awareness Month. But as he said correctly, it's not just in the month of September that people have these, is, these issues and these challenges and these feelings and, and the, maybe the depression that could, could lead uh, to a, a suicidal situation. That's why we wanted to get shed more light on uh, this discussion, which many people might feel uncomfortable with and might prefer to, to leave it in the background or leave it uh, under the cover of uh, anonymity and so on. But let's, let's, uh, let's talk it out. Let's get some, some, some clearer understanding of what we're talking about here when we deal with the issue of suicide in Trinidad and Tobago. Coming up towards 6.33, we'll take a break and continue right after this. <laughs> Six thirty-six and a half in Trinidad and Tobago. A bit of sunshine in Princess Town uh, this morning, as uh, there isn't too much traffic at uh, this time of the morning. And uh, indeed, with people back out to work after the Republic Day holiday yesterday, school back in session after the day off on Monday, plus the holiday, so it will be an extended weekend uh, for school children. So it should be uh, quite a bit busier. We're busy in studio this morning with Hanif Benjamin, clinical therapist and clinical traumatologist, dealing with issues associated with suicide and broad to, to self-harm and depression and so on so uh, mr. Benjamin continue let's let's talk about uh, the, the issues that uh, maybe non suicidal but self-harm and so on and, and those issues that could be indicators of a, a broader mental health issues uh, and uh, you can take it forward and and you're quite right uh, there is a there's a serious correlation between um, non-suicidal self-injury and suicidality but they are all grouped into this 
term which is suicidality or, or, or really to harm oneself. Basically, that is what it is. But there is a clear distinction between the two. And even for practitioners, um, we need to understand this. Because how you treat with someone who is self-injurious is very different to someone who is suicidal. And I think even the medication that you use, um, if someone is to be medicated, um, it's, it's going to be different. It, even the questions that you ask is going to be different. And so we need to understand um, the difference between non-suicidal self-injury and also suicide. The, the very clear difference is one is meant to die and one is not. Suicidality is meant to die. I want to die. I want to kill myself. I want to end it. That is suicidality. That is finality. There is no coming back there. And when you talk about self-injurious behavior, it's really I, I want to deal with some form of emotional turmoil within. And so I commit self-injurious behavior. Now, a lot of times, even in our school system, when a student cuts oneself, the ambulance come and they treat it as a suicide, an attempted suicide, and you do a suicide risk and all of those things. All well and good. But there is a clear difference between someone who wants to die and someone who wants escape, internal escape. And so that is very critical. So in general, an SSI that we call it is a behavior undertaken to feel better or cope, whereas suicide-related related behaviors are end of life. And I want people to understand that parents who have children or even adults, there's a very clear difference. Now, can one move to the next? Yes. Because if it is that you are cutting for release, just like a drug, you begin with small amounts, but you're, getting, you're not getting the relief that you want, what you do. You take more and more. Self-interest behavior is just like that. You cut, and then you cut deeper, and or you find other methods to inflict pain to bring about relief. Just, just uh, I mean, and, and, and I always keep interrupting, and I know it's not no, right. for you, of course, mm -hmm. but I often struggle to understand uh, did, how does cutting oneself, how does harming yourself, how does the brain function to make you believe that cutting yourself will provide some sort of release mm -hmm. from whatever it is you're going through? It's really to regulate emotion, you know. This, all of this is about emotional regulation or dysregulation. And so you cut to soothe yourself, you cut to, to, to give yourself meaning. For zero, it's a strange phenomenon in the mind when you feel empty. When a person feels empty inside as if there is no life, when you feel as if there is your despair, and despair is the, after despair is death. So when, once a person gets to that point of despair, feeling as if there, there is no love, no one loves me, there is no purpose of living, they want to feel something for zero. And, and, and that want of feeling re results in the cutting, the, the, the inflicting pain is so that they can feel something to see if I am alive. And I will cut deeper and deeper. I will pull my hair, whether it is pubic hair or what. I will cut. I will ice. Because there is a new thing called icing now. Just like how you make ice cream a long time, you put salt on the hand and you put ice, you end up with first and second degree burns. You could imagine the excruciating pain that brings about. And so what people who are non-suicidal, self-injurious mean is that they want to feel something. They, their emotion needs to be strike. They, they want a feeling. And that is why they cut. That is why they injure the body. That is why they harm themselves so that they can actually feel something. And it, it's strange because people do that for that reason. People do it to punish themselves as well. People do it because they have no other means of life within them. And so if that doesn't work for you and you keep attempting deeper and deeper and deeper, that may then lead to, to suicide. suicide. Yeah. And so you see the continuum. Yeah. And so if that person is not rescued at that point, if the clinical intervention, if no one notices that this person is spiraling further and further into despair life, then the, the, the end result may be suicidality. But it may not have started out as I want to die. It may have started out as I want to feel something. I want to experience something. Now, when you talk about non-suicide self-injurious behavior, you also have to throw in risky behaviors there, you know. 
unprotected sex with multiple partners, just risky behaviors, driving recklessly, doing reckless type of things, challenging the status quo in a way that is very reckless to oneself or family. Those are self-injurious behaviors as well. Because again, you want to bring about a, a, a form of release. You want to bring about a form of, 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 of the endorphins moving within your system. And those are the things that happen. And so sometimes, most time for you we push it as you want attention yes they want attention and that too is a challenge so we push it aside that that child miserable or that person just want attention but the reality is that they want attention but they want attention for help they want help and no one who is self-injurious wants to just be left alone you see they all want help and so we need to get them that kind of help and so we need to pay attention, and, 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 and some of my researchers are saying to me that self injurious behaviors start between the ages of 12 to 15, as early, and girls are four times more likely to commit self injurious behaviors than boys. Why? Because girls are more emotional by nature. Men and boys are very steadfast in their approach. So once they have decided that this is what they want to do, they do it. Very rarely you will find a boy who is self injurious however it is there. But you'll find that girls are more self-injured, they're more cut they're more, you remember? And this goes along very nicely with the statistics of, well, I don't want to use the word nicely, nicely yeah. but, but it goes but along. It correlates. It correlates with, 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 with men taking their lives more and females attempting more. And you will understand the attempt when you talk about self-injured behavior. So if you look at what I just said in terms of the deeper the cut, the deeper the cut, leading to... You see, it may view as an attempted suicide. And so there is a correlation there. And so it is important in Canada, they are saying that there are 2,500 young people every year who, who is admitted for self-injurious behavior. Now, we hardly capture that data in Trinidad. So when people go to the hospital for self-injurious behavior, we really don't capture it. But if you look at those numbers, you will see how high it is in relation to suicidality, as well as I don't even think that we capture suicidality in a real sense in this country as well. I suppose the little data that we have that you've highlighted from mm -hmm. the 2012 study and the 2011 study would show uh, our suicide rates to be the highest in our, our region if you could extrapolate that again you don't want to be, you have to be very careful making certain assumptions it, it's reasonable to assume that if you're going to have that high level of suicide mm -hmm. you will have a, a, a similarly high level of, of self-harm and a tendency towards self -harm it, it by more young people. more yeah. it is going to be a lot more for you it's probably going to be about four times more mm -hmm. because you remember people self-harm more right so you have more people self-harming than more people uh, committing suicide however the current data is also saying to us that Trinidad and Tobago remains some of the one among the highest in terms of suicide, suicidality and men also remain among the highest in the region and so those statistics are real uh, real time and so when you talk about the non-suicidal self-harm that too is very critical a lot of us don't take our children to the hospital when you see the cut-in a lot of us don't take our children to the mental, for mental health treatment, to the psychologist, the social worker, for cutting. So if you really were to capture that data, you will understand how frequent our children and even adults, but for adults, it's more self injurious behaviors, you see, than that injury. So you'll find them more in the behavior type, the, the risky behaviors that I spoke about. But our young people now, you find that there is a lot of cutting. Teenagers who hurt themselves but do not intend to die are high risk of suicide attempts. Because, as I pointed out earlier, if I keep cutting, if I keep icing, and I am not getting the relief that, I, that is intended, then I will try to commit suicide at some point. I will try to commit suicide at some point. And so, for us, for you, that is why the conversation cannot be a September alone. Because we need to be able to get in front of this in our schools. I am sure if you speak to principals and teachers, they will tell you how many students cut every single day. But what would you say, uh, Mr. Benjamin, to, to those parents who might be watching right now and say, look, I don't want all your raising this in the school to give my child any ideas at all, because they may see it that way. They may see that you, because there's this kind of 
herd mentality thing that you, you, you see people in groups on social media or on the internet or wherever talking about these things and urging one another on to these things and say the last thing I want is Hanif Benjamin or anybody else as well-meaning or as well-qualified as they might be coming into a school and telling my child about awareness and so on and putting thoughts in their head. It's very simple, Fazir. The conversation is happening and you're quite, you're quite right. People are saying and urging and all of these things. It means that the conversation is happening. However, the wrong information is coming out, inaccurate data is coming out, and also people who are ill-meaning are speaking more. They are speaking, they are controlling the internet and the airways. However, so, so whether you want to or not, parents and whomever might have that thought, the conversation is already out there. The challenge, though, is that we, the professionals, or the people who are well-meaning, we are not speaking enough about it. And therefore, the, it, it, it's, it's happening. Whether or not you want to believe it, it is here and it is happening. And I do not agree with, 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 with the herd mentality as well. That is in a minority. That is in a minority, a, a very, very slim minority. The, the challenge is that people are really suffering. So how do you intervene? And, and so we, we must begin to educate children and all of us about coping mechanism to deal with stressors. It starts with stressors in life. It starts with our inability to manage our emotions. Something happens and our emotions become dysregulated for zero. We, we are not able to manage the emotion. So what we do? We begin to self-pity, self-wallow in that, and then it leads to certain other types of, of behaviors. Now, you mentioned um, mental health. It's, it's very closely, again, correlated. Because once you go into those stress factors and you're not able to manage those stress factors, depression sets in, anxiety sets in, and that comes with its own set of trials and tribulation. And so we need to get in front of the conversation by giving people correct information about what it looked like, what it feels like. And more importantly for Zero, we don't ever talk to the survivors. And again, because of taboo and religion. And so we want to hush. We want to push it in the back. We don't want people to know. We don't want people to talk about it because they're going to bring shame to the family. We don't want to talk about it because you're going to be the laughing stock of the community. But the important thing is we need to speak to those who are survivors. Why did you feel the need to do this? What was the point, the breaking point, from non-suicidal self-injury into a suicide attempt? We need to talk to people who have been down this road so that we can learn firsthand what was that point so that we can craft better messages for people who might be living in that situation now. As clinicians, we need to do more groups. We need to bring people together so that they can say, you know what, I have lived through this and I want to tell my story. People who have been through it must be supported supported so that they can come out and speak about it but because of the taboo we shun them we push them in a corner you see and because of that we are not learning the, the intricate messages that they can tell us they have the remedies for this they have lived this and so we can partner with them and understand better for zero but the conversation is out here and we must do better at it because whether we want to or not if a person decides that they want to kill themselves, that is what they will do. And if a person decides that I want to hurt myself, that is what they will do. And until we can intervene in a real way, in a real way, that's the only way it's going to happen. Uh, and con continue as, as you, I, I know we're taking a step-by-step -step process mm -hmm. this morning uh, as, as far as the, uh, getting to, to some sort of resolution as to how we, we, can, we can deal with, with this particular challenge and, and bring it more into, into the light as far as the many issues on the table here. So some of the risk factors for you that I want people to be really cognizant of here. You see, and, and the two may overlap and that is why I say it is very easy to think that someone who is self-injurious is also suicidal. And the many risk factors, first and foremost, is depression. That is clear among both um, spectrums. Substance use. And in either a beginning or an increase amount of substance. And when I say substance, whether it is drink and or drug, whatever it is. So anxiety is another major, major factor. Impulsive aggression. And so you find that people become very impulsive, they are very aggressive, they're very nonchalant, they're very um, 
attacking of everything that happens around them. And that, that was not their normal modality. Yeah? So these are things that are new or increasing. Yeah, you're talking about history of childhood trauma is also very common among people who are heading down that road. Also, people who have very limited coping mechanisms, so people who cannot handle stressors real well, that is what happens. You see, and so you enter into tertiary education and you can't handle failure, you can't handle um, the rigors of, of tertiary education, and you feel as if there is no way out. And because, uh, of course, home, you're being pressured to do well to bring home the A's and on one end you're pressured to do well at work, you're pressured to be the best and you can't manage those levels of, of, of pressure, you tend to go into this zone. And so those are some of the early risk factors that you want people to notice. Yeah. And, and in, in dealing with those risk factors, well, know, know that as okay, family member, good friend, you've noticed these things. You, 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 you've high, you, you say, well, okay, now that you mentioned, I really realize so and so has mm -hmm. been behaving this way. What do you do then? How do you intervene? Listen, you ask the question very clearly. How can I help? What can I do? Are you right? Leave me alone. No. What can I do? Yeah, I say what? Leave me alone. I am here for you. You see? I for see? me interested in that. Just leave me alone. And, 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 and listen, just being here is sufficient. One of the greatest healer, one of the greatest tools that we could use is self. The problem is, Fazir, we always tackle this from a very negative, derogatory type of modality. So we, we, we start with, you're looking for, 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 for excuses, you're lazy, you're this, you're looking for attention, why you don't get over it, it's so long it happened. Those are the type of conversation we have with people who are living with depression and or are on, on the spectrum. Those are the kind of conversation that push people further away. Those are the kind of conversation that push children further into a dark hole. Those are the kind of conversation that push employees into a dark hole. An employer who is very nonchalant about a person who might be living with something, bearing in mind that this person was a stellar employee, but yet there is no understanding that something might be going on. And so you're pushing them further and further down in the abyss. You see? Those are the kind of conversation that we're having. And one of the things that we must do for you is change the conversation. And just by changing the conversation with a person who is living with depression is the beginning of the healing, even though they say, nah, I good, leave me alone. Just by changing your modus operandi towards that person changes the way they begin to see the world. We're going to break and take a break in about 60 seconds uh, for, for the news and then we'll continue for a few more minutes with, with our dialogue with Hannah Benjamin. But just on that point, is it that people, and we, we, I, I might have raised this question in different contexts previously, that's, that people don't want to inter go too deep into it because they may be afraid they, they can make things worse mm -hmm. because they're not trained, they don't have the necessary expertise. Yes, I'm here for you, but I ain't really too sure what I should be asking you because next time I make things worse for you. Mm -hmm. And you're quite right. And so, again, there, there are literature out here that can help you. And, and when we come back, I will definitely give you some of the questions that you should be asking so that you can enlist from a person how they're actually feeling. Y you know, so when, once we come back, we can deal with that part. Indeed, uh, uh, bec because it is something that, that I'm sure many, many of you out there might have, have, have recognized it, that, that maybe you, you want to assist. Uh, and, and Mr. Benjamin pointed out, and then we asked, how you're going in the sense, well, I are right in, in a kind of casual kind of way, not really expecting expecting somebody to say, well, boy, things are getting worse and worse with me or things are going too well and we don't really want to get involved because we don't know what might be the outcome, but we'll try and deal with that in, in some way in the time that we have available. Let's pause for the news and then we'll return in our dialogue with Mr. Benjamin. <laughs> That started from creation. 
coming of course five minutes after seven o'clock in Trinidad and Tobago and as you would expect with the sun coming up not too much cloud cover in the east it's brighter and brighter thro throughout Trinidad and Tobago and along the east-west corridor and here as we look in San Juan where the garbage bags are back at the top of El Socorro Road after they were absent uh, following the passage of Tropical Storm Karen on a Monday morning and the students are back as well with school uh, back in session and uh, lots of them on the move this morning hopefully to ensure that they get to school on time well we don't have much more time left uh, with our guest Hanif Benjamin clinical therapist and clinical traumatologist as we talk about the issues related to suicide to self-harm the questions you want to ask the issues of afterwards uh, what, what is the sort of impact what is the sort of situation we should be addressing in the aftermath of, of, of such an eventuality and I, I know for a fact we don't have enough time to go into it in great detail but Mr. Benjamin what further information can you can you provide for us in the time we have available and, and so why why does people really get get to that place and, and there are four major areas you're talking about to feel better and people ask the question like you did earlier why would you hurt yourself to feel better and people feel as if that can help them release some type of pent-up anger frustration whatever it is to communicate emotional pain and that's a major one they want to communicate how they feel emotionally but they don't know how to you see and that is why they get involved into some of these activities to feel a sense of control sometimes people have no control of their life the things that are going on around them however they can control that aspect of their life i will control how i end my life i will control how i feel and so therefore they enter into either non-suicidal self-injurious behavior or suicidality and of course there's a sense of punishment because they feel that the problems around them are their fault they are the ones to blame um things are not going good in my family because of me and and so now they they either commit suicide or end up with some suicidal non-injurious behavior and so some of those are when you ask yourself the overall action I wonder why those are some of the I wonder why that we can look at and so people again might just appear withdrawn they might appear frustrated have rapid mood changes you move from one mood to the next swinging like a pendulum all day you know they, 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 they seem to have a major issue that occurred in their life something of great significance probably did not go their way and so they react a sudden reaction to it and so before the break you were asking what 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 to ask yeah, people yeah. how do we ask people what's going on without making it bad and I, and I pointed out prior to the break that most of our conversation put people in a more difficult situation and so today I want people to understand to take a pause and to understand that a person who is either self-injurious or attempted suicide did that because of pain and hurt. That's number one. They are living and suffering with some form of something that needs help. So the first point of conversation is about help. How may we help? Don't be judgmental. Why you, why, when you, why you didn't come to me? Why you didn't kill yourself? Why, 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 why? We always want to go down that road. Stay away from that road. Be very clear in your communication that you are here to help. You're not here to judge what means you, 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 you use to deal with whatever your difficulties were, but I am here to help. So you want to be very clear. You want to ask people to tell you what is going on with them. Do not assume anything. Ask them what is going on with you right now that have caused or is causing you along this particular behavior. Let's hear it from them. From the time we begin to, to, to assume and stuff, we have removed their voice. And so we will never because, know. Because the answer from them might be totally at variance with what you think is the problem. Very much so. Very much so. Don't put yourself in the mix. This is not about you. For example, is it that I caused you to do this? Is it that I know you're putting guilt on the person? So don't do that. Don't, don't as ascribe you being the, the, the person that caused. You, you see? Or are you stronger than that? You could have managed this. Don't use those is kind it a of difficult thing for, Is it a difficult thing for us to do to just allow somebody to talk out their feelings without feeling we have to jump in with a judgment? Well, one of the most powerful tools in therapy is silence, you know. The most, one of the most powerful tools is silence. When you are silent as a therapist and you allow a person to purge, 
to bleed their heart, to come out and say how they feel. It's one of the most powerful things in the room. When you as a mom, a dad, a son or a daughter could sit, a boyfriend or girlfriend, and have someone speak to you and to be listened to. I'm not speaking about a hearing here to jump in, you know, yeah. but to sit and to be truly open to hearing what the person is saying on a different level. That in itself is therapeutic and change lives across board. And I often tell my students, when you talk about this active listening, it's a powerful thing. And I saw a clip very quickly on one of these morning sh um, talk shows in America. And I told my friend to send it for me, and I'm going to use it in my teaching, where I think it's Tamara and Tiamora, or whatever they name I don't, it. I don't know. You, you, well, you won't know it. What are those? I, 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 yeah. <laughs> and so they, they were having the same talk. Yeah. And one of the person asked her, how are you doing? And she said, oh, I'm fine. I'm wonderful. And there was a pause. And in that pause, she began to cry uncontrollably on television. She wasn't okay. We assume that when a person say, I am okay, I am all right, you have to listen beyond the words. You have to be able to listen for the emotion and their behavior that goes along with the words. We don't listen for intent. And because of that, we miss key factors. A person is passing you every day and saying, I'm fine. But yet that person is dragging baggage of pain and hurt behind them. And that is something that we need to ask when we truly ask a person, what's going on? What happened? Rather than why you do that? Why you didn't come to me? Those are powerful changes in the way we talk. And for you, from the time you begin a conversation that way, you remember that stance you put up, no, I don't need no help? That changes because the person see you differently. The conversation is very different. Your, your, your sense of care and passion becomes different. And so people now want to engage with you. So you know what really happened was, those are powerful tools. As a therapist, I see it every day. And you can also see this in your home. Just sit and sit to your son and daughter, talk to me. And in, and in the time that we have available, because uh, again, time is going by so very quickly. You mm -hmm. I know you wanted to deal with the aftermath. And uh, that, yes? Yeah, go, go, go right in. For three, that is a major part that we don't ever get to. And that in itself is a whole show or conversation. Because again, we are so bound by stigma and stereotypes and, 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 and shame and guilt, we don't ever talk about when it actually happened. The family bury and quickly try to get rid of that. We don't want to talk about that. And it becomes an elephant in the room for life. Nobody wants to talk about it. Or people begin to feel guilt and shame. And so they don't want to deal with that guilt and shame because they say, probably if I had known or if I had done something. I am saying to parents and family members and loved ones, move away from that understand what it was, understand what it is, and help the person. If it was an attempt, listen to the person. Do not bring the Bible and beat the person over the head with it. Do not bring societal ills and norms and beat the person over the head with it. Listen to that person in the truest of sense and say, listen, you went through this. Look at the antecedents. Those are important things. What led you to this phase so that I can understand better what you were dealing with and what I might be able to do now to help you? Teachers, psychologists, social workers, all of us, parents, bar none, should look at the antecedent and say, what happened in the 72 hours leading up to this? What is causing a young person to self-injure? Those are critical things, but we're not having those after conversation. And we need to begin those things because it does two things for us, for you. It allows us to learn the mind of the person so that we can become better clinicians, we can become better family members, loved ones, so that we can help people. And and two, we allow the behavior to change without being judgmental about what they did. And, and in, in the few seconds that we have remaining, Mr. Vijayan, we always appreciate you, you joining us to give us the, these different perspectives, which we don't have enough of as far as conversations and, and, and so on. Uh, is it that, you know, sometimes people feel, yes, I, I hear all that you're saying, Mr. Benjamin, but I have enough burdens to deal with, I have enough issues to deal with in my everyday life mm -hmm. than to take on somebody else's issues. And that's fine for you. That's fine. Your job is to pass them on. 
If it is that you cannot, and I'm saying to people, you are not a professional, you probably don't even know the words. Sometimes a hug helps. But you know what? There are professionals out here that we can get them to. Whether it is a public hospital, private treatment, whatever it is, there are places available. And I have tested those places so I know it works. And so you know what? If you feel as if you can't carry that burden as an employer, as a friend, as a loved one, refer go with them walk with them in the process so that they don't feel alone that's a major thing a lot of these people feel as if they're alone in this battle and i'm saying to them they are not alone and that is why i'm urging my fellow clinician to start to create treatment groups so that we can help people understand that they are not alone but in the fa in the few seconds yeah, that sure. i have yeah, right five ahead. no nonsense tips straight up ask direct question don't beat around the bush and make it awkward right listen to the answers in a real way listen for meaning do a safety check look out for safety both physical and mental safety don't keep secrets don't don't come somebody tell you about suicidality and you want to keep it a secret no no for children or adults and of course ensure that the person seeks professional help above all because this is real for you. Suicidality, non-suicidal self-harm is real. And I want people to understand beyond September that we live this in these villages every weekend. Somebody committing a suicide over relationship situation, over financial situation, over problems. This is real. And we live it every day. So it is time that we wake up and we begin the conversation from as early as our primary schools. And because people can be helped. And as you said correctly, September might be awareness month, but this is a 12 months of the year sort Correct. of issue that we, we should be dealing with in, in, a, in a much more comprehensive sort of way. But as always, we appreciate your presence with it's us always a pleasure uh, this for morning you. Uh, on a Wednesday, the penultimate uh, edition of our Family Focus series for this season three. We'll have one more coming up next Wednesday. Then we'll take a break until December before we resume and get going with season four. But indeed, we do appreciate that quite a few people have mentioned to us how, how important and how valuable they see these sorts of dialogue something that doesn't often happen uh, in, in in general uh, uh, media talk shows and whatever else as far as getting to, to this sort of level and hopefully it, it it is useful in some way in in helping us along in the real issues of everyday life we'll be back right after this break here on morning Edition. Whoa. 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 Whoa.